You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. If you're visiting with us, we want to say thank you so much for visiting with us. Uh, my name is Pastor Roger. I'm the teaching pastor at UCC, and uh, we're going to continue on a series we started off a few weeks ago, um, a few months ago now at this point in time. We're actually almost done this series, and I'm really excited about our next series, but I'm not going to tell you what that is just yet. This morning, we're going to take a look at one of the most famous chapters in the book of First Corinthians, and we're going to totally slaughter it, which will be fantastic. But let's recap what we talked about last week. Last week, we looked at First Corinthians chapter 12, and this is the famous passage on the body of Christ, right? This is where Paul uh, uses the kind of the most famous metaphor for whatever church is. And we started by asking the question, what does church mean to you? And now, I know when I ask that kind of a question, there's so many different responses. So perhaps you might be here this morning, and you have perhaps had a... How do I gently say this? A bad experience with church or a negative experience with church. If that's you, that's kind of like everybody at some point in time has had kind of a a bad uh, uh, encounter with church people or church leadership or whoever it might be. And so what Paul was trying to get us back to was he tries to use this organic metaphor for what the body of Christ was meant to be. And what he says is that it's this organic entity that is, and again, remember, he's using an ancient first century metaphor of a body. They didn't know about cellular structure. They didn't know about the multiple systems that run through the body. They're just seeing it as a functional kind of hands and feet and all that. But what he's saying is that it's actually meant to be together. But what's actually kind of interesting is, and this is the part of the chapter that people don't really kind of realize, is that whatever the church was meant to be, the very final verses of it is that Paul says, the church was actually meant to be a place where the weak and the broken could find a place of safety to recover. Right? So remember, this has been a theme throughout 1 Corinthians. Remember we talked about this idea of meat offered to idols. Remember what Paul says? He says, you know what? If eating meat offends my brother or sister in Christ, I will never eat meat again for the rest of my life. And remember, again, I say this to you, the only two things that scare me, right, is spiders and vegetarianism, right? But what does Paul say? Paul says that if eating meat is going to offend my brother and sister, I will never eat it again. And the reason he says so is because it's not about his desire or his freedom, but what's most important to him is the unity within the body of Christ. We talked about this idea of how the church has become today, right? There are two types of people that exist within the church today. And for a lack of a nicer way of saying it, they are parasites and they are symbionts. And we looked at two definitions of them, right? So a parasite is something that lives off an organism that basically sucks the energy or the, the, the resources from that body without giving anything back. Or there's what's called a symbiote. And, and again, not the venom type symbiote type of idea, right? Uh, but it's more of the idea of a reciprocal, where you, you, you take but you also give back. Right? Within, the, within the Western church today, there's a really, uh, a really bad misunderstanding about this in regards to what our functionality was supposed to be in the church. And I love when, when Paul gets to verse 27, he says this uh, kind of s- to summarize it, right? Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now, what I love about the idea of what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, what he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, is that he doesn't give us an escape clause. And the escape clause looks something like this. Well, I just... I attend occasionally to this church, or I'm a part of this community, but really I'm just trying to figure things out here. Paul says, no, no. If you understand the body of Christ properly, you are a part of it, whether you realize it or not. And because you are a part of it means you are given a, um, a profound responsibility to actually be a reciprocal part of it, 
right? And so we have to kind of really transform our thinking about that. That's what we talked about last week. This morning, we're going to look at one of the most famous chapters in 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. This is the love chapter, right? This is, this is the chapter where most people who are not even Christians know this chapter because it's every, every wedding, right? Every wedding has this chapter, and I'm going to talk about that in, in a second here. But before we do that, let's talk about how useless love actually is. Okay, so a great article by a guy named Gaver, uh, uh, G- uh, Barry Daverett, and the uh, article's title is Love is Overrated. Then this is what he, I told you I'm going to totally slaughter the chapter, right? He says this, love is never enough to sustain a relationship. Pause. Right? What does Hollywood tell us? What does every sitcom tell us? Right? What is, what is uh, every song that we hear is that love can overcome everything? Now, that's a great sentiment, but perhaps it might not be as true as we think. I didn't know that until my 30s, so you in your 20s, spoiler alert. Uh, that might sound crazy, but as a child of the 80s, I fell under the influence of catchy pop lyrics and coming-of-age movies that suggested love always overcame disagreements, differences, and disruptions. A decade plus of romantic (laughs) disappointments taught me the absurdity of such a simplistic view. There's no magic in love, and that realization jaded me for a while. That would be a great kind of dating app, uh, romantic disappointments, right? And and you don't really go into it saying, hey, you know what, I'm really excited. It's like, you know what, I'm kind of over this, but let's see what happens, right? He goes on to say this. I've learned it does matter, just not the way culture had implanted it in me. To understand love in a way that's resourceful, look at it from a different perspective. That's actually kind of, in, kind of interesting thing he says, right? So as culture defines love, we kind of get to go, are, are, are we sure that that's enough, right? Um, I've always found it interesting when people use the phrase soulmate. I found my soulmate. Well, I always find it interesting when they find a different soulmate like a year or two later, right? It's always like... What kind of soul do you have, really? I just, I just want to ask that question. Another guy named Mark Manson has this uh, great, uh, I, I stole this uh, our, uh, quote from his article. He said this, In our culture, many of us idealize love. We see it as some lofty cure-all for all of life's problems. Our movies and our stories and our history all celebrate it as life's ultimate goal, the final solution for all our pain and struggle. And because we idealize love, we overestimate it. As a result, our relationships pay a price. When we believe that all we need is love, then like Lenin, we're... John Lennon, not, not, not Stalin Lennon, you got that, right? We're more likely to ignore fundamental values such as respect, humility, and commitment towards the people we care about. After all, if love solves everything, then why bother with all the other stuff, all of the hard stuff? Love is an emotional process, compatibility is a logical process, and the two don't bleed into one another very well. What I think he actually says is kind of interesting, right? Is that when we're trying to fall into love, trying to find that partner for us, there's certain aspects that we, we think about. And the problem with that idea is, is that, fun fact, the human species wasn't meant to live as long as we do. So if you think back, say even, let's go back 150 years, right? 150 years ago, the average lifespan of a human being on the planet, depending what part of the world you lived, it would be about, on average, 40 years old. So you would get married about 18, 18, 19, sometimes 15, 16, and in uh, some cases, 14, but that's a whole different ooh, right? But you'd get married around then. You don't really have to endure the person for about, you know, 15 years and you're dead, right? For the most part, most marriages can handle 15 years, and then you're gone. What's interesting is, and again, I say this in a, in a purely kind of anthropological, sociological point of view, is that we're now living so far out now that we got to love somebody for way longer than we were ever designed to. I know that seems kind of a weird thing to think about, but it's interesting that when you look at love songs, you look at love poetry, you look at that idea, it idealizes the beginning stages of love, but never talks about past that, right? This is why people have, this is why right now, one of the little interesting, but when I use the word interesting, I, I, I could probably say horrifying, trends in culture right now are people who have been married 20 years plus getting divorced. By the way, as far as uh, demographics go, that was almost unheard of even 40 years ago, there was this idea called the seven-year itch. You may have heard of it. It's a movie. It's a book. It's a song, right? But the idea behind the seven-year itch came from this, uh, this way of looking at that. If you could make it past seven years of marriage, you're in for the long run, right? Now, we know that was kind of overly simplistic, but there was some data to back that idea up. Now, we're seeing people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s getting divorced, which, again, just to be clear, was unheard of, you know, uh, so long ago. And one of the interesting things about it is, is that 
we've realized that perhaps we loved a person in the beginning, but that person begins to change. We don't love what they've changed into. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know because we see this all over the place in culture. Uh, one metaphor that one person said, uh, one uh, relationship guru, which I don't know what that means. I, I, I want to be a relationship guru. I don't know why. I, I just, I'd be the worst one ever. But anyways, um, he says something like this. He goes, you know, when we think about the beginning stages of, of romance, we think of this idea of a sports car, right? It's flashy. It's this, it's that. It, 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 it gets to our most uh, basic of instincts, right? It's, it's, it's a very instinctual way of relationships. But he goes, but that's the first part. Then you have kids or family, you grow up or you get your first job. And then it's different. He goes, it's, it's more of a minivan, right? And he goes, but, but that only lasts for a certain point of time as well, too. Because believe it or not, you know, these little parasites we call children, they do grow up at some point in time and they do, they, they do leave the house. And after that, he goes, it, it becomes more of a sport SUV. You get to kind of enjoy life now with, you know, your, your kids gone, right? And, and so when he says that, we have to find a vehicle that encapsulates all three of these together so that you could kind of think of something different when you look at the longevity of relationship. Now, you're asking yourself, what does this have to do with 1 Corinthians 13? Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But let's talk about how love has been reinterpreted in the church. Because we can look at the culture, and something we do at UCC is we don't just look at culture and going, oh, look how what they're doing. Because this has actually infiltrated the church as well, too. Um, I'm not going to say her last name correctly, so I'm just going to say Lindsay. Says it this way. Uh, a common word progressive misuses, uh, progressives misuse frequently is love. And she's talking about progressive Christianity. This is this, what we would call neo-Christianity today. Instead of love being defined like it is in 1 Corinthians 13, it is watered down to some namby-pamby concept of comfort. Making someone feel uncomfortable is unloving. Now, we're all not for creating unnecessarily awkward moments, but Christianity inherently makes people feel un make people uncomfortable. Nobody likes having their sin pointed out, and living in community is often, well, uncomfortable. We can't use others' level of comfort as a barometer for how well we are loving. What's interesting within Christianity today is there's a movement within Christianity that says that, you know, the most loving response that we can have for culture or for people is to say, this is, like, as you are is fine. Right? And that is our way of looking at it, but really when you look at the idea of, and we, we, we did a whole series on the whole Holy Spirit was, there is meant to be a transformational aspect of our faith, that we are meant to be continued to grow. Um, Randy Elkhorn says this way, once we deny parts of God's truth, we're no longer under the authority of scripture, we become our own authority. The Jesus we speak of will not be the scripture-believing Jesus of the Bible, who is full of both grace and truth. He will just be the loving Jesus remade in our culture's image, and in our image, in which we redefine love as absolute tolerance and moral indifference. Every time we look at a chapter, I ask a question, well, this morning I'm going to steal uh, a quote from somebody, well, actually a song title, and this is from, you know, from the 80s, so those of you who can remember this, but I'm going to steal somebody from the mighty Tina Turner, and the question she's going to ask is, what's love got to do with it? And uh, she's not wrong, and so that's what we're going to ask of. So if you have your Bibles or your digital devices, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to look at the entire chapter, and I'm going to slice and dice this morning because we need to talk about what's really going on here. But before we do that, let me just kind of give you my thoughts on this chapter and, and just in brief. 1 Corinthians 13 might be the most famous of all the chapters in this letter. It is the chapter of love. Unfortunately, this chapter seems to have been relegated to weddings and sappy poetry and thus robbed of its counter-cultural impact. This chapter, chapter might be the most misunderstood and misapplied of all other chapters in Corinthians. What's interesting about this idea of love, and we'll look at the verse in a second, is whenever you hear it, it's always at a wedding. And, and what's so beautiful about that is, you know, you see, the, you see the bride and the groom, and you just hear this verse, and you're like, oh, right? It's like, oh so nice, right? And so we see that and we go, oh, this is what Paul's talking about. No, he's not actually. And if you had this scripture read at your, at your wedding, it's totally fine. I'm just saying that perhaps by using this category of love, we are missing out on what Paul's actually saying. And what he's actually saying is very countercultural to what the first century church was going through, but also what church is going through today. So Let's take a look here, and let's just remind ourselves where we've been so far. So when we look at this idea of, yeah, I went too far ahead. Um, chapter 9, remember Paul talked about this idea of freedom and self-denial, right? Uh, when, when meat offered to idols, I'll never eat meat again. 
right? Chapter 10 was all about idolatry, right? And remember, the first century Corinthian church was surrounded by idols. We talk about idolatry today in the sense of like, oh, you know, TikTok is an idol. And I don't know if that's true, but I could feel it be true, right? But we're talking about actually physical idols, right? It's like, you know, temples to these idols. Um, chapter 11 is all about disunity. It's all about this idea of what, what, dri what drives Christianity, Christians apart. And man, there's a lot of that today, right? Chapter 12 is about the Holy Spirit functioning within the church. We looked at the spiritual gifts and gifts of the Spirit, and we kind of try to define that. Well, chapter 13 is love, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the context for this love? What is actually Paul saying about the love that he uses? So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to go through the chapter fairly quickly. I'm going to point out a couple of things, but we're going to spend a lot of time defining this love at the end. Because unless you understand what Paul's actually saying here, you're going to miss out on what, he, uh, what the context and the application of it. So let's take a look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. And of course, this is all very recognizable to you. It says this, If I could speak in the languages of, of, of earth and of angels, but didn't have love, uh, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or clang, uh, clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I sort of all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have nothing. So remember, just, just a quick note, Paul just spent an entire chapter right before this talking about spiritual gifts about how these spiritual gifts are important, how everybody in the church has spiritual gifts. And then he comes in chapter 13 goes, vroom, and just cuts that in half, right? Now, what's interesting about this and why I think this is kind of important is there's a reason why he does this, right? And again, we'll get to that in a second. But remember, chapter 12, all about spiritual gifts. You have a spiritual gift. You know what your spiritual gift is. And as Ben rightly pointed out, in the past, this is how God has used me. He could use me differently in the future, but we all have a way that God can use us to impact the world. We go, okay, great. But Paul comes along and says, by the way, none of that means anything. I'm like, wait, what? You just, you just spent a whole chapter hammering us on this, and now you're going to come along and say it doesn't mean as much as you think it is? It not only does he say it means, it, it, he goes, it means nothing. Like zero, nada, niente, bobkes, like nothing, Okay. That's the only way I know how to say nothing, right? So that's it, right? He goes, oh, okay. Now let's take a look at verses 4 to 7. This is beautiful, right? Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Never, no, love never loses faith and is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. You know this, these verses, right? Again, I guarantee you, as I'm reading them out loud, you're thinking of a wedding you were at where they read this, right? And be, again, the application to husband and wife, I get it. It makes complete sense. But that's not what Paul's talking about, right? Now, Paul's going to give us two reasons for what a loveless Christian looks like. He's going to give us two reasons in the next few verses, and I want to point them out to you because these are important. One of the things we've been talking about at UCC is something that everyone's been talking about is that what does church look like post-pandemic, right? We're into the fall now, and, and I just read this article just yesterday uh, about, you know, how doctors are looking at COVID variants and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, I think most of us feel, not that we're over COVID, it's still here. You know, I, people have gotten COVID. But that fear that was associated with it, that, that, that dread, it feels like it might be gone, right? We're, we're like, you know, I'm, I, I know if I get it, I'm not, I'm, for the most part, I'm not going to die. So with that understanding, we kind of, we, we're bravely going into the fall and going, what does the future hold? But what we're asking ourselves within the church is that, uh, what, is, what does it look like in the church going forward? But like, what has, what does the church experience during this time? And as I have said, I think that the church put its worst face forward during the pandemic. We, as Christ followers, we looked like the culture, right? And again, I said that again, this, no, this is no surprise, but what was, what was most disappointing to me as a pastor is the metrics that culture was using, the church adopted that language. And because of that, we were tearing ourselves apart. 
Well, we're, we're having conversations of identity, of, of vaccinations and masks and, and lockdowns and all these things. And these are fine to talk about, but these became identifying factors as Christ followers, which again, we said, our identity in Christ is not these things. And so the enemy, I don't want to say wisely, but definitely used this as a way of kind of pulling the church apart to the point where people of different viewpoints were no longer talking to one another. People were going to churches who saw the things the way they saw them. Even our church, we lost people uh, from our church because of our stance on it. And so what was interesting is that we reflected the culture because we were acting like the culture. So what does a loveless Christian look like? Well, I think we actually have a pretty good idea what a loveless Christian looks like. Uh, let's go on to verses 8 to 10. So this is the first reason that he tells us for a loveless Christian. Prophecy and speaking in unknown language and special knowledge will become useless. But love that lasts forever, uh, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. So this is the first reason. I'll, I'll summarize it in a second. The second reason is seen in 11, 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything complete, just as God now knows me completely. So what are the two reasons that Paul gives us? Right? So the two reasons that Paul gives us for this lack of love within Christ followers is, uh, one is the first is this idea of ignorance, right? The idea of partial and complete. You know what's interesting about us is that we look at a person and we can judge them, but how do we judge them? Well, we judge them on the exterior. Well, the exterior is really partial and complete, right? Because what we don't know is what's going on in the inside. We talk about this at UCC that we have to always be careful not to judge somebody's um, you know, outside with our insides, right? In other words, what we're going on, what we're going through internally, we look at something like, well, why don't they go through that? Well, you don't know what they're going through because you're judging their outside, not their inside, right? So the first reason for the lack of love is ignorance, this idea of we don't really understand somebody. It's easy to hate somebody, and we talked a little bit about this uh, two weeks ago. We said one of the reasons why we are so divisive is we can dehumanize one another. How do you dehumanize somebody? Well, they see differently than I do. They look at the world differently than I do. Therefore, they're less human than me, and therefore, I can classify them and look at them in a way that, you know, really little belittles them. Well, as Christ followers, we are never allowed to have that, but unfortunately, as Christ followers, we were doing that. But the second reason that Paul talks about this idea of lack of maturity, and again, this is, uh, this is absolutely what's happening in, 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 our, in Christianity today. What, what, what is going on, whether it's on social media or, or, or wherever, a lack of Christian maturity is just out front and center, right? We are acting and behaving towards other people in ways the Bible never allows. We are classifying, we are talking about one another, we are arguing, we are tearing each other apart, not by what God would have for us, but instead what culture would have for us. Again, we are participating in culture as culture. Um, Dr. Shively Smith, she has a commentary on this, and I think she's absolutely right. Before we jump into what uh, what's, what the context of love, I just want to read her commentary on this. She says this, Paul writes 1 Corinthians in response to the opposite situation. Paul declares love as the greatest power in community that seems to be lacking a lot of it. The members of the Corinthian church to whom chapter 13 is directed are nowhere near a love fest. In fact, they are the very placement of 1 Corinthians 13 suggests that Paul may be up to something, right? So remember, we, we, as we've gone through 1 Corinthians, we've seen the issues that the church in Corinth has gone through. But remember, Paul could have started the letter to 1 Corinthians with chapter 13. And really, it's kind of a nice thing, right? You remember when you want to give someone some constructive criticism, you have to always give them a compliment first? That's just how you do it, right? By the way, I think you're doing a great job exhaling carbon dioxide. Nobody does it better than you. Way to go, fantastic. But really, could you show up on time to work? Because you're, you're just not, you know, that would be... that. Would, you know, you have to give them a compliment first. And sometimes the exhaling carbon dioxide, that's all you've got. But at least you got something, right? Paul could have started the church, the, the, the book of Corinthians with love. Wouldn't that be great? The, the, the church in Corinth gets his letter. Love is kind. Love, love, love. Oh, this is great. We've got to put a song to this. All right? Let, 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 let's release a worship album for this. So this would be, be great. It's not until chapter 13. And by the way, there's only a few chapters left in the book that Paul actually unloads this. Why? 
because he's got to get them to the right place. You can't talk about love until you understand about the things that tear love apart. So Dr. Shilley, she's absolutely correct when, when she mentions this because 1 Corinthians 13 is placed exactly where Paul wants it because he understands that he's got to go through a lot of things first before we can get to that point. So that's 1 Corinthians 13. But now what we have to do is we have to talk about love. And what we really have to determine is what is the context for this chapter because it's not for weddings. It's not about romantic love. Okay, so that's completely different. So before we talk about that, the one thing we have to understand about why Christians are loveless is I think that there's a lot of Christians that are walking around that are emotionally broken. I asked you a question at the very beginning to recap what we talked about last week, and that is when we talk about church, if I said to you, hey, how many of you could share a story with me of the time you were hurt by somebody in the church? Please don't put your hands up. We would be here for about a week, I would say, you know, because everybody at some point in time has either been disappointed, hurt in, in some way, shape, or form, by the church. And again, I include UCC in this. I don't, uh, please don't under misunderstand me. I don't think that we are a perfect church at all. But we've all had stories of this, right? But what's interesting about that, ha when that happens, is that it creates scar tissues upon our hearts. Scar tissue is this interesting phenomenon in the human body where there's just, if you ever have a, a, a scar somewhere, there's just this numbness, right? You just can't, the nerve endings have been torn, you just don't feel anything. Well, enough s emotional scar tissue can be piled upon your heart, you just don't feel anything. And because of that, I think we have a lot of walking wounded within the church. And when we think about this idea of loveless Christians, I feel that what we have done a really poor job within the church is finding ways of talking about this and healing this because no matter what you are, wherever, whatever phase you are in your relation of, relational lives, whether you are looking for uh, a partner, a spouse, or, or whatever that might be, you always bring baggage from a previous relationship with you. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, I was a youth and young adults pastor for 20 years, and so I've always, I've had a, uh, a great deal of opportunity to talk to young adult populations. I remember this one young man uh, came to me, this is back in my previous life as a young adults pastor, and he came to me and he said, Pastor, I'm having a really hard time finding a wife. And the fact was, he wasn't an he wasn't ugly, so I, 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 you know, I didn't have to have that conversation with him, you know, uh, which is always an awkward one. Have you tried the gym? Uh, you know. Anyways, I didn't have to have that one. I'm just being honest with you, probably too honest. Um, please don't tweet that. Um, but I, I said, oh, okay, so, so tell me, what's, what's going on? And he just kind of related his, his, his dating history, and basically no relationship made it past two months. I said, oh, okay. I said, so how often has this happened? He says, it's like the last... Six, I think, six or seven, you know, girls that he's dated. It just never lasts past two months. I said, okay. Um, have you ever thought that the problem might be you? He's like, because like he was thinking that I was going to, you know, give him some dating advice or I was going to tell him some sort of new, I don't know, whatever. And I said, no, maybe the problem is you. He was kind of offended a little bit. This is why he never got to me for advice because this is why I'm not a relationship guru. Uh, it's, it's not me, it's, it's definitely you. Um, and so I said to him, well, well, let's talk about how you look at relations and let's, let's unpack a little bit about that. And what it turned out to be is that, you know, he just didn't understand how to take a relationship past two months. He began to lose interest. And again, you know, there's a whole neurological, like endorphins, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. But, you know, past two months, he just would get bored after a month, a month and a half. And, you know, it, he would start treating the person, you know, accordingly and, the person being smart is like, okay, I'm out of here, right, type of thing, right? So it, ma it made sense. Well, th what I wanted to say to him is that before you could actually embrace a proper healthy relationship, you first must unpack a little bit of the baggage you bring along with it. Well, that's kind of the same thing with the church. It's before you can really embrace this idea of what community looks like. When we talk about this idea of the body of Christ, well, if you've been hurt by the church in the past, if you've been wronged, and again, there are stories out there that are just absolutely atrocious, and I don't want to minimize that at all. But at some point in time, there has to be some healing that takes place, or else you just, you j you'll always have this timidity about this idea of engagement within the body of Christ, because you can't trust, you can't be vulnerable. If you can't trust, if you can't be vulnerable, then you can't be intimate. And intimacy in this idea of a biblical understanding is being vulnerable to one another, right? How do you pray for one another? How do you bear one another's burdens? How do you care for one another if you don't want to share, if you don't want to talk, if you don't want to be in a relationship? 
And that's actually kind of what C.S. Lewis and Dostoevsky uh, kind of talk about, right? Wh when C.S. Lewis and Dostoevsky try to figure out, you know, what does hell look like, right? What, what does hell look like? Well, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, says it this way. There is no safe investment. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it up, wrap it carefully around the hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all the entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all of the dangers and perturbations of love, I don't know if you have to look that word up, is hell. See, what, what C.S. Lewis is saying, and I think he's absolutely correct, is a loveless Christian is basically creating their own little hells. Dostoevsky says it this way, what is hell? I maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love. See, what's interesting is, is that the church can be a place of transformation or it could be a place of hell. And you're probably sitting here in the sermon, I feel that right now, pastor. Um, right, but what, 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 what Tolstoy, and, uh, sorry, uh, not Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and, and C.S. Lewis are saying is, is the lack of love is, is the beginning of hell. And so when we talk about loveless Christianity, I, I need you to understand something. Loveless Christianity is this idea of stagnation, is this idea of lack of movement, right? And when you think of it this way, you'll realize that everything that God intends for us is not in the safety of never being hurt, of never being wronged. See, that never happens. And so whatever love is meant to be, we have to realize that there's always a risk. There's always a chance of being hurt, and the chance is probably greater than we imagine. Now, let's talk about the context. So we've been talking about this idea of love, and I, and I want you to understand something. Paul front and loads who the focus of this is, okay? So I want you guys to do something for me right now. Can everyone stand to your feet? I know you're all comfortable. Your seat's exactly you are. Now, I want you to do something that you've been wanting to do all service. Turn around and look at other people. Go ahead. Turn around, just look at people. You can wave, just, you know, go say hi. I didn't say shake hands, but you can if you want to. No hugs. Okay, sit down. Those are the others. You just looked around at people. Some of you knew, some of you didn't know. Some of you are like, hey, here's my number, right? Uh, here's my Insta. Uh, you know, whatever it might be. Point simply is, when Paul talks about who you're supposed to love, he tells us in verse 1, 2, and 3, it's the others. See, the problem with this chapter on love is we think of it in a romantic sense. It has nothing to do with romance. Fun fact, though, Paul doesn't define who the other is. He just says love others. Now, we can extrapolate that he's talking about people in the church, and that's the bare minimum, right? What does Jesus say? What good is it if you love those who love you? Don't the pagans do that? Don't the, don't the uh, cheating tax collectors do that? So that's a baseline of the most kind of fundamental part of it. But knowing who Paul is and how Paul teaches, the other is also the person who sees and thinks, like, uh, thinks differently than you. And if we want to go even to the Jesus level of it, the person who hates you. The person who looks at you and says, because you're a Christian, you're a moron. How can you think that there's this the big, big spaghetti monster in the sky? Right? That's the person you're supposed to love. That's the other. Oh, you wear a face mask? Oh, you're vaccinated? Oh, you vote for this political party? Oh, you're this skin color? Oh, you're that? That's the other. See, the reason why I think this chapter has been so misunderstood is that we apply this mostly to romance. The reason I got you to stand up and turn around, well, A, to wake some of you up, but B, is to see these are the people you're meant to love at the first level of it. And you're like looking around like, I don't even know that person. That person's too old. That person's too young. That person's, you know, I don't, whatever. I don't know. Whatever classification you want to put. That's your opportunity to love. Now, let's take a look here at the word, uh, what Paul uses here. Now, what's interesting, and again, I didn't, <clears throat> in my research, I didn't write the person's quote. This is somebody else's quote. I don't ever want to steal somebody else's quote. Oh, no, no, sorry. This quote I do know. 
uh, I apologize. This is a guy by the name of Rodney Stark. Rodney Stark is a historian, but he's also somebody who looks at the early levels of Christianity. He has a book called Early Christianity. If you're a nerd, I recommend you read it because it talks about the first 300 years of Christianity. This is what Rodney Stark says about the early church. He says this, The church was attractive to non-believers because it made the ancient world a lot more bearable. What Christians did was take care of each other. Christians loved one another. And when they got sick, they took care of each other. Someone brought you soup. You can do, do, you can do an enormous amount to relieve those miseries if you look after each other. If you look at the Roman world, you have to question whether half the people had any humanity. Going to the arena to enjoy watching people tortured and killed doesn't strike me as healthy. Christianity told the Greco-Roman world that the def definition of brother-sister has got to be a lot broader. He says this as well. There are some things you owe to any living human being. To cities filled with homeless and the impoverished, Christianity offered charity as well as hope. To cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachments. To cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity provided a new and expanded sense of family. To cities torn by violent ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for social solidarity. And to cities faced with epidemics, uh, fires, and earthquakes, Christianity offered effective nursing services. What was so attractional about the first 300 years, right? We call this the anti-Nicene period of Christianity. It's the part of Christianity that I'm obsessed with. What, what he says is, is that all the classifications of the Greco-Roman world, right? Paul talks about it, right? Slave or free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, and other ways he uses other classifications as well. He says, none of that means anything. He says, they are the others, and the application of love is for them. And what made the early church so attractional to people? Could you imagine walking into a room, and maybe this morning, is, if you're, this is your first time, that might be you, and, 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 and feeling that the group of people that were there loved you, thought about you, cared about you, just not because of anything you have done or said, not because they grew up with you, not because they like the same music as you, not because they had even the same political or social views as you, but just because you were made in the image of God, just because you were created in God's image, they go, yeah, you're worthy of love. See, what I find so interesting about Western Christianity is in all the ways that we talk about what, what's going on in the world, we seem to forget about this passage. Again, we relegated it to weddings or sappy poetry, but that's not who Paul's playing the context for. Let's go on. A guy named Stephen D. says it this way. So the word love that's used in this chapter, of course, is the agape word. But what I was curious about, where, where, like, how did the non-Christian world use the word agape? Well, Stephen D. kind of had a commentary on this. That's what he says. But the word agape existed long before the New Testament. The earliest accounts showed it being used by epic poets like Homer to describe relationships on the battlefield. Generals would love their soldiers with agape love. Soldiers would fight and die for each other because of agape. Agape love was the love of the battlefield. All these expressions of agape love had one thing in common. They all expressed a love based on identity. A soldier loved a comrade because he identified with that person. By loving him, that soldier was also loving himself. Agape love did not always mean the cross, but that doesn't diminish its importance of the gospel. It helps us understand the gospel better. Love forged from sacrifice and conflict. See, what I always find interesting is that when we look at the New Testament, the Greek words that Paul uses, the Greek words that the writers use, well, they were used before this. Agape love is a word that the New Testament writers take and they steal. And they infuse it with a different way of looking at it. But its origins come from this idea of a battlefield. What, what I love about that is that in battlefields, when you are fighting alongside somebody, you put your life in their hands. You trust them in a way that you've never trusted another human being. Because if they break that trust, you're dead. So it's the idea of identity, of sacrifice, of conflict. That's where this idea of agape love is forged. So when Paul takes it, the church in Corinth is going, wait a minute, this is a very weird word that Paul is using to describe God's love for us. But let's go on because there's more to it than that. Ken Boas says it this way, agape transforms relationships because even if it's not reciprocated, it doesn't destroy us. We can still love even when we're hurt or wronged. It's a love that is not merely theoretical, but is expressed in action. 
See, agape love isn't the love of reciprocity. Reciprocity is I love you, you love me, that's good, right? Agape love is I love you and the person looks at you and says, well, doesn't love you back, right? It, they look at you and go, well, I hate you. Agape love says, well, I don't, your, your classification of me is not important. The love that I'm loving you with transcends your hatred or your differences to me, right? And I think it's kind of important. Um, Ray Steadman on his commentary actually has some kind of interesting says, you know, there's a piece of this, uh, in this chapter where it says love never fails. Well, the actual translation is love never falls, which is kind of a weird way to translate. That's why in the English it's translated love never fails. It means the same thing, but Ray Steadman kind of points something out here. The reason is that the apostle has employed a very unusual Greek word here that is translated ends. Love never fails, never, never, love never ends. In the version that I'm using, it really means to fall. It says our love never falls. Now that sounds strange to our ears, but it's meant in the sense that love never falls away or disappears. It never quits. It's never used up. Love keeps on coming. The more you use it, the more there is. That is the point of Paul is making here. So when Paul says love never fails, he means it's, it's, it's a... It is an infinite source that we tap into. Um, if you notice at the very beginning, the title of my sermon is called The Habit of Love. I listened to this podcast a few weeks back, and uh, I, uh, my, 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 uh, I listen to really weird podcasts, so just, just be aware of that. The podcast that I was listening to was all about death, and they were, they were interviewing a, um, a uh, who's the person that takes care of this at the funeral home? A funeral director, thank you. Uh, and he was talking about why grieving is so difficult for Western culture. Uh, of course, something I'm kind of fascinated with. He said this, one of the reasons why we have such a hard time with death is, is that we get in the habit of love. And that, that phrase, habit of love, really stuck with me. Because what he said is that we've gotten the habit of loving this individual and they're gone. And so this habit of love has no reciprocity. They can't love us back because they're now gone. And so part of the greeting process, as he understood as a funeral director who had worked as a funeral director for almost 40 years, is that people have to figure out how to get this habit of love in a way without the person there to reciprocate it. And I thought to myself, isn't that agape love? Isn't that this idea of love that, that is given out but doesn't expect to be returned? That love never falls. There's this idea of something called a love hermeneutic, how we look at the Bible. It's, it's started by a guy named Augustine. Right? Augustine says it this way. The New Testament lies hidden in the old, and the old becomes clear in the new. He unpacks this in a writing called De Doctrine Christiana, which means of Christian doctrine. And this is what he says. Anyone who thinks he has understood the divine scriptures or any part of them, but cannot by his understanding build up this double love of God and neighbor, has not succeeded in understanding them. So what Augustine was saying is that if you can't wrap your mind around what the Bible is talking about of loving God and loving your neighbor, which Jesus says is really the culmination of the law and the prophets, well, your faith really hasn't come that far. It really hasn't grown or matured. And again, this is a stinging indictment for the church today. We can't look to culture, to other religions, to other people who are even atheistic and say, well, you should be this. That's not our job. It's the agape love that we have to apply to them that's really going to show them we believe this. Uh, this is the quote that I, I, I couldn't remember who the uh, commentator was. I don't like to steal from other people's stuff. I can't remember who it is. It's a great quote, but I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, the uh, commentator says this, Biblical agape love is the love of choice, the love of serving with humility, the highest kind of love, the noblest kind of devotion, the love of the will, intentional and conscious choice. Pause there. Agape love isn't something that is stirred up within us. You don't look at somebody going, man, because of how great they are, I'm going to agape them. Agape love is this, I love that person, not because of what they are, who they are, what they represent, but because of what image that they're made in. Remember, we looked at this idea of agape in the battlefield, you identify. Well, the only way you can hate somebody is when you dehumanize them. The only way you can rehumanize them is realize that no matter what they do, what behaviors they have, they're made in the image of our creator. Therefore, they're worthy of dignity and love. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean you have to um, take whatever they say to you to heart. It just simply means how you interact with them is 
vastly different than the world. And again, the world is looking to cancel, to tear apart, to, to you know, classify, you know, coerce, whatever you, however you want to look at it. Christians have a different metric, a different ethic altogether. Almost done here. So remember we talked about the power and the gifts of the Spirit? What I loved about that last quote we just looked at is what agape love is, is that as we talked about the gifts of the Spirit, one person said to me after the service, when we talked about it, is that they said, I didn't realize that all of us had gifts of the Spirit. I just thought God gave some people gifts of the Spirit, and those people are meant to be the superstars within the church. I didn't realize that we all have gifts that the Spirit wants to use in us. Now, the great thing, but also the intimidating with that, is that if I say to you, we all have gifts of the Spirit, then you get to go, well, I don't know what mine is. You know, I, I, I don't know what my gift is. See, what Paul is trying to say here is don't get obsessed what your gift of the Spirit is. Instead, love intentionally. Love willfully. Because even if you don't know what your gift of the Spirit is, even if you can't quite pinpoint it, you do have a choice, and the choice is love. This is why Paul comes along in chapter 13 and goes, listen, just so you know, forget about your gifts of Spirit. Forget about speaking in tongues. Right? And as a Pentecostal, I was like, what? Right? Like, forget all that. Just love. Love intentionally and love willfully. If you can do that, then everything else that a person does means nothing. And again, he literally used the word nothing. That if you intentionally love, you are far superior to somebody who raises somebody from the dead. Which, by the way, is a kind of a cool miracle. Right? But if that person raises somebody from the dead, but then goes on social media and just like, Rah! Paul says you're nothing. You're absolutely nothing. Because without love, we're nothing. Almost done. Three quotes by three different individuals that kind of continue to kind of give us this idea of agape. And then I'm going to show you something in, uh, in how, how Jesus used it with Peter. F.B. Meyer says this way, Wherever there is true love, there must be giving and giving to the point of sacrifice. Love is not satisfied with giving trinkets. It must give the cost of, uh, it must give at the cost of sacrifice. It must give blood, life, all. See, when we talk about the cross, we talk about Jesus uh, on the cross, to, to, to the Western culture, that seems like a, a, a grotesque, barbaric thing. And to a certain extent, we as Christians kind of go, yeah. But in a different sense, we go, but it's the kind of the ultimate act of love. Dying not just for the things you did, because Jesus was perfect sinless, but dying for somebody else, but not just dying for you know those who follow Christ, but those who spit on Christ, those who hate Christ, dying for them as well. See, the cross, properly understood, is the ultimate act of agape love. Uh, Kenneth Burr says it this way, agape is a love that impels one to sacrifice oneself for the benefit of the object loved. It speaks of a love which is awakened by a sense of value in the, in the, in the object loved, an apprehension of its preciousness. Again, all Gollum quotes aside here, right? But think about this, right? When we identify at the other person, the other, as being in the made image of God, they can spit on us, they can curse us, they can call us morons, they can do all these things, but love never falls, love never fails. The well that we get to love them is not based upon the feelings that we have for them, it's based upon something deeper and more profound. And finally, Tertullian, the, uh, the Nicene father, says it this way. It is our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness, that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Look, they say, how they love one another. Look how they are prepared to die for one another. What was the attractional part of the early church? For those of you who perhaps might be new to Uptown Community Church, one of the things we talk about here is we don't, we don't get involved with the whole performance aspect of worship. We don't get involved with the idea of making sure everything's perfect. We're not into that. Worship isn't about the newest album, the lights, the camera, you know, people, whatever. It's not all about that. Nothing wrong with that necessarily, but we're not about the performance. Why? Because worship is not about what we do. It's who we worship. It's about God. So even if it was up, me up here with a triangle or spoons, which would be hilarious, by the way, leading you in worship, that doesn't change who we are worshiping. God is not modified 
by what, how, the methodology of our worship, he is God. And what Tertullian was saying, and what he's absolutely kind of identifying within us, is that whatever we understand about who God is, this is the basis for our understanding of how we love one another, how we actually proceed to take care of the other. Let me close here. There's a famous passage in John chapter 21 where Jesus has an interesting conversation with Peter. This is a post-resurrection appearance. So you know the story, right? Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? But I want to show you something here because in the English, you're not going to see what's actually happening here. In the Greek, you're going to understand a little bit more. So John chapter one, 21, verses 15a, it says this. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I filio you. The word filio means friendship, brother, right? Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. So Jesus says something to Peter. He says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter's like, heck no. But Jesus, you're my BFF. Jesus, I can, we can be friends, right? Look again, verse 16. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I filio you. Like Peter can't do it. He just, he can't. He can't rise to the challenge. Now, you know the third time, Peter gets hurt, right? I never understood why Peter got hurt. It's not just a repetition, because I would have got hurt after the second time, right? If my wife says, hey, did you do the laundry or did you feed the dog? And I say, yes, she asked me again. I'm hurt. I told you the answer. I'm not lying, right? I, I did what you did. But it's on the third time that Peter gets hurt. Now, why is that? Well, I didn't understand this until I looked at the original language. Look, verse 17. A third time he asked, Simon, uh, Simon, son of John, do you filio me? See, Jesus drops agape to filio. And this is why Peter gets hurt. Because he sees Jesus now matching his level of love, which is not what he wants. Because Peter looks at Jesus, says, Jesus, I can filio you, but I need you to agape me. I denied you three times. Right? I, I, I denied you three times. I, I, I'm... <laughs> I, I, I abandoned you at the cross. Like, I, 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 like Jesus, I can filio you, but Lord, I need you to agape me. Right? I never understood this exchange until I understood in the original language what was actually going on. Peter needs Jesus to agape him, and sweet, merciful, so do I. But what is Jesus asking of Peter? He's not asking for an abstract love towards him, because what is Jesus' response? Feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. Right? It's an agape love towards others. But Peter is saying, no, no, I can, I can fill you those who love like me, Jesus. But agape, that's, that's too much. So take a look here. I went through the chapter, and I took all the examples of lovelessness, and I took all the examples of love. And what I realized is something what Paul was saying is this. These characteristics, they're stagnation. We talk about this at UC a lot. We used to see a lot. We talk about spiritual development. As a matter of fact, our next series is, is going to be kind of about that a little bit. But what we talk about at Uptown Community Church is that we are not just here to entertain you. We're not here to perform, blah, 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 blah. But what we're really here for is to provide you an opportunity to grow, to develop. So I don't know when you decide to follow Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and perhaps you haven't even made that decision. I get that. But wherever you are, you are on a spiritual journey dare I say, a spiritual adventure. Well, with that journey or adventure, what you are is you're meant to kind of grow in this. See, Christianity in its stagnation, it becomes loveless. You not allowing the Holy Spirit to stir, to grow within you, that's when you become loveless. And so then I looked at the other part where it says, okay, this is what love looks like. Well, this type of love, that's what transforms. See, if you love somebody and they hurt you, it sucks. But it's also an opportunity to dig deeper into agape to understand what God has for us. What does C.S. Lewis say when he talks about this idea of forgiveness? I forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. And the reason I, I give that to you is because when we are hurt, when we are harmed, when we are, when we are broken, when we are suffering, it is so easy to lash out. It's so easy to kind of go, ah. But see, what agape tells us, what this love tells us, is I don't draw upon my ability. Can I tell you something? I asked you the question beforehand about, you know, how many of you have been hurt by the church? 
If you really want to have a deeper understanding of that, you should go to a pastor's conference. That's all we talk about is how our churches have hurt us. You think you've got stories? Try getting an email from somebody about how bad your sermon was or how, how much your, your church sucks or how much they don't like something. Believe it or not, we pastors, we're, we're kind of human. I know we think we look like sociopaths sometimes, but that stuff hurts. Church for us is kind of what we try to do. And as pastors, especially during the pandemic, I can't tell you how many times I got emails from people criticizing some part of the church. And all we were trying to do was trying to navigate our churches through this very, very difficult time that nobody was happy, no matter what decision we made. And they let us know it. This is why we have this whole idea of the, you know, the exodus of people leaving jobs to go to different jobs. Well, over the last year, I know about seven pastors that have left ministry because they found the equivalent job outside of ministry. They're like, you know what? I get paid the same. I don't have to deal with people yelling at me. Done. Done. We get hurt too. But guess what? Pastors have become loveless as well. We get to go through the motions. Remember I told you, uh, this is back in August. I know a lifetime ago. But part of what I try to do every year is I try to fall back in love with you guys. I know it seems kind of weird. But I have to love you to want to pastor you because it's not really worth anything else. And some of you, I'm not pointing anybody out, but you can be difficult to love. But you just, you're, just, you're just my opportunity to, to kind of dig deeper into agape. And I just, you know, I can be difficult to love too. Trust me. If I got my wife up here to tell you that, well, let me tell you, right? But the point I think is kind of interesting is that what Paul was really saying is that agape is what transforms us. And if we don't allow it to transform us, we become loveless. Now, there's one last verse, verse 13. You know this verse. It says this. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. There's something called a force multiplication or a, a force multiplier. A force multiplier refers to a factor of, or a combination of factors that dramatically increases the effectiveness of an item or a group. I've always wrestled with this verse because I never really understood why Paul does it the way he does it. It says faith, hope, and love. Well, I would think of maybe other characteristics I would put in there. But Paul uses these ones. And I realized something a while back that I want to show to you. I don't think what Paul is trying to say here is put three classifications, kind of going, well, you need these three here, but the most important is love. Instead, I kind of started seeing this, for those of people who like math, as a math formula. And when I saw this is Paul saying faith plus hope actually equals love. And where I got this was actually from the writer of Hebrews, right? So what does the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 say about this idea of faith and hope? He says this, faith shows the reality. You know what faith has to do with love? It's not that, that the love is going to be reciprocated. Not that the person you're loving is actually worthy of it. But faith is the idea of the, and it shows the reality, right? The, the, the faith is this idea of this, we don't see it, but we just believe it to be true. And what I believe to be true is that everybody deserves love. That's my faith aspect of it. Well, what about hope? Of what we hope for. What do I hope for? Is that by me loving you, you will be somehow transformed by that love. That's my hope. And if I don't have these two characteristics in place, then I'm not going to end up on love. And what is love? It is the evidence of things we cannot see. See, if I love you as God loves you, then I treat you differently. I, I look at you differently. And that's the evidence of things I can't see. I don't know the internal transformation that's going on in you, but I certainly don't want to be the person that's going to reverse that transformation or be a hindrance to that transformation. And I tell you, I got to tell you, I, I, I really wrestle with that because I can. I'm human. I will make mistakes. I will mess up. I will uh, absolutely all these things and, um, and more. But if I have faith and then I have hope, well, then the evidence of what I'm trying to live in you, to live to be to you and you to the other and to those outside of these, of these walls is this idea of love. One last story. So all this week, I've been thinking about love. On Tuesday, I was at the gym, and I saw somebody I haven't seen for 43 years. When I was a kid, I was very small. I know I'm towering right now, so you can't imagine it, right? I was bullied by somebody 
for about four years straight. I'm not going to tell you his last name, but his name was Sean. And I want to tell you from 7 to 11 until Sean moved away, him moving away was the best thing that ever happened to me. For four years straight, this kid made my life a living hell. He was two years older than me and twice my size, which, again, was no problem at all because I was so tidy and lanky or whatever, right? But he, he beat me up. He, like, like, and we lived in the same government. I grew up in government housing. When we immigrated from India, we grew, uh, you know, uh, we grew up in government housing, and so he was one of the people that were in there as well too. So I couldn't escape him. As long as I could go home from school, and you know, he lived somewhere else, he was in my uh, my, uh, my government housing. And for some reason, I, I I just I bugged him. And fair enough, right? But he took that out of me in different ways. Well, on Tuesday, I saw him at my club. And do you ever have those revenge fantasies? I do. I just thought, you know what? I'll take one of those dumbbells and go, boom! Remember me, Sean? He was on the thing. He was doing, he's doing, uh, he's doing, uh, what, the push-up, the bar, the heavyweights, right? I thought I could just walk up behind him and take a thing and just drop it on his head right now. And <laughs> I, I'm just being honest with you because these are the things that go through my head. All week long, I've been thinking about agape love. All week long, I've been thinking about love. And there's the cat, there's the guy that even, even seeing him, I had a visceral reaction. I'm like 51. I saw him and, oh, I just, I just, I just, I wanted to do something so badly, right? And all I could hear was the Holy Spirit going, agape, agape. You know, God can be so annoying. And, of course, y- the, the, the way the happy end of the story is like, I walk up to Sean and say, Sean, I know you really, you know, whatever. And uh, I didn't. I just ignored him. Because I was so angry. I was so, oh. Because I'm sure he doesn't even remember who I am. He's just, I was some sort of punk kid that he just torched for four years straight in school and back at home. But he was the person that God was calling me to love. And I hated that. Right? I hated that. I didn't want to love him. I didn't want to like him. I didn't want to see him, actually. And I, I hadn't thought of him for decades. And yet there he was. And the funny thing, is he looked exactly the same. He was still bigger than me, too. Right? So, you know, I didn't even have that. But I walked away from that going, and I, I felt like the Holy Spirit saying, <clears throat> that's who you're supposed to love. The person who tormented you for four years straight. The person who, who beat you up on a weekly basis. That's who you're supposed to love. I thought, man, like that's just, that's just the worst thing I can imagine. But yet, this is, this is how Paul is trying to use the word love, right? Love is patient, love is kind. Love, are, love never bears any, any record of wrong. All I had was the transactions in my head of the wrongs. And so basically my prayer life that week was me trying to forgive Sean. Lord, I, I forgive Sean. Oh, just, you know, take away his hair. Make him bald. I don't know, Lord. Right? Smite him or something. But what's interesting to me is that this coincidence was a very real application of what the, we were talking about this morning. I don't want to talk to you about love and say to you, oh, this is so easy. Just love people. Kumbaya, baby. <laughs> it wasn't that way for me. This week especially. It was like, oh, okay. All right, Lord. You really called me to love somebody who really I hated for so many decades. But see, unless you understand this idea of, of, of the true sense of love, you're not going to get the counterculture what Paul's talking about. See, it's not love is kind of the, all these things for a wedding or for a romantic couple. It's about in the room. You stood up and you looked around the room. Well, there's people you don't know. You're supposed to love them. You'll leave this, this, this building and you'll go home, you'll go to school, you'll go to work throughout this week, and there's going to be people who don't love you, who don't care about you, and, and matter of fact, may go out of their way to make you miserable. That's your opportunity to love. And it's not because of who they are, it's not because of how they treated you, it's because they're made in the image of God. Just to be, I, I, I want to, because I just want to be absolutely honest with you, I'm still working through Sean, I'm still trying to forgive him. I say the word I forgive him, but until that emotional component of it is gone, it's going to be hard. I refer you back to my series on the art of forgiveness because I've been going through those notes again because I need to go through those notes again. But that's where love comes from. Faith plus hope equals love. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. 
Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Not gonna make you do anything. I just don't want you to think, I do want you to think though. Ask yourself this question. Who do you hate right now? And see, most of us say, oh, I don't hate anybody, but that's not true. There's somebody in our lives, past, present, that is that point of pain, that point of lovelessness that we need to confront. Because unless we do so, we can slip into this idea of that some people are lovable, some people are unlovable. And in doing so, what we really are robbed of is the beauty and the transformation and the effort and sacrifice of agape love. And Jesus, in his conversation with Peter, is calling us to a different kind of love. Now, love isn't about agreeing with people or their behaviors or their actions, but it also means we don't treat them as they deserve. We don't think of them, curse them in our hearts even, but instead we say, somehow, some way, Holy Spirit, transform me so that I can find that agape, that sacrificial, that <laughs> battlefield love so that I can truly see the world as God does. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of it. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, first and foremost, I pray for those who are those who perhaps have slipped into lovelessness without realizing it. It is so easy to go through the motions. It's so easy to pick sides, label people. But God, that's not what you've called us to. Unfortunately, Lord, the church has kind of forgotten this. We have forgotten that we don't treat others as they deserve to be treat, treated. We don't even treat them as they treat us. Instead, we love in a way that is profound, transcendent. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us today, this morning, throughout the week, really the rest of our lives. That, Lord Jesus, we would allow transformative love to change us, to grow us. And God, remind us as well, too, that while we might be the victim sometimes, we are also the victimizer that we are not innocent in our self-righteousness and that sometimes we need to realize that so that we can have more grace, more compassion for others as well. Jesus, I pray for Uptown Community Church. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be a, a, a community of love, that those who come to us, student, whatever, whatever background they are, that they would feel loved because they are made in your image and they are worthy of that. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that what is said about us is that that group of people, I don't get everything they say, but I do know they love. I ask all these things in Jesus' name.